Hi, everyone. I'm Brene Brown, and this is Unlocking Us. And guess who I have with me this week? Y'all say hi. We're back. Hello. <laughs> My sisters are here. <laughs> Yay. We are coming back to do a follow-up to the Summer Sister Series on the Gifts of Imperfection because we got a lot of questions in the comments on social media. And so we're going to try to answer as many as we can. Before we jump in, let me just tell you, let me remind you about <laughs> Ashley and Barrett. And how our lives have changed since the podcast. No, yeah, <laughs> right. I will tell you, I mean, this is probably a warning. Like, you know, we're cussy to begin with, but holy shit, we are ass high and taking care of kids in massive transitions right now. And we are really knee deep in some parent caregiving. How yeah. are y'all feeling? I'm tired. Ashley was going to retake the wholehearted inventory so she could just see how it changed from the summer and she didn't get through it. <laughs> I was like, 50%, 50%, 50%. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like we're in a, I don't know, we're in a tough spot. Let me tell you a little bit about Ashley and Barrett before we get started. Ashley, when she was five, came downstairs <laughs> from school. Oh, I'm, this is, I'm not reading the bio. I'm just telling you all the story. <laughs> Ashley, <laughs> Ashley when she I'm was going. five and when Barrett was five, obviously identical twins, came down the stairs for the first morning of kindergarten <laughs> and know. Barrett had on cutoffs and tube socks and a flannel and two braids and like high top tennis shoes, getting ready to take the court. She was a baller, still a baller, my pickleball partner. So she's total baller. <laughs> Ashley came downstairs <laughs> with her hair loose in locks, a hat, a dress, <laughs> patent leather shoes, and in case the weather turned, <laughs> she was carrying a parasol. <laughs> this is because my mom... And all her infinite wisdom read Twins and Super Twins when she was pregnant with Ashley and Barrett about like kind of the dangers of (laughs) little did they know. Little did she know at the time. Like, like, Do you think the book is really described the dangers of twins? (laughs) Yes. As an older sister, I would say (laughs) that this (laughs) subtitle is Twins and Super Twins colon the danger of twins. (laughs) The genetic, that. <laughs> the genetic anomaly that wreaks havoc. No, no, not kidding. I'm just kind of kidding. Um, but it was just, that's how different they were and how fun, how funny it was. Um, but my mom was really careful that they could, you know, dress themselves and they had each other own personalities. And when did she start separating y'all in classes? I don't think we were ever allowed to be in the same class. So I think it was from the beginning. She always asked for us to be in different classes. What about the... Don't listen for a minute. Shh. What about the episode of This Sucks? Oh, oh yeah. That, well, that was in middle school. I think by then it was just whatever the schedule said. That's what we did. Yeah. This is the story where <laughs> the teacher handed out a test. That I had been studying for for a long time because if I got an A on this test, I got an A in the class. So Ashley had really been pouring herself into this <laughs> test. And the mimeograph was bad and barely legible. And Ashley says, This sucks. And then what happened? I got sent to the principal's office. <laughs> she got sent to the principal's office. And Barrett, in response, took a marker and wrote a big zero on her test and took it up and turned it in to the teacher without taking it and followed <laughs> Ashley out the door. <laughs> Said, no, you suck. <laughs> Actually, I think what I did is I was holding my pencil and I put a ruler on the top of it. And I just sat in my chair and was spinning the ruler <laughs> on my pencil. Until she excused me. (laughs) (laughs) You got yourself kicked out. Yeah. So then we were both down in the office. But together. Together. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I still still remember her name. Oh, yeah. We won't mention it. (laughs) The name of the teacher? Yeah. No, no. Whisper it to me in Igpe (laughs) Atmwe. (laughs) I'm not (laughs) you. Okay. So... Ashley Barrett, serious bio. Ashley is an LCSW licensed clinical social worker. Finally, that license got updated by the state. 
the clinical license. Like you get your MSW master's in social work and then you're like a licensed master's in social worker. Then you have to go do a jillion hours of therapy and then sit for a monster exam. Then you pass that and then the state has to like actually do it on their record. So congratulations on your LCSW being yeah. final. She has a Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies with a specialization in early childhood education from Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. Favorite restaurant in San Marcos? Gilbert's. Okay. Oh, I like this sentence. Fueling a passion. Let's do it from like like the movie thing. <laughs> in a world where she is fueled by a passion from working over a decade in Title I schools in HISD, <laughs> Houston Independent School District. Ashley pursued a Master of Social Work from the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. Whose house? Cougs house. Okay. <laughs> people are going to be like, people are going to see you walking right now, either laughing or rolling your eyes and be like, what is that person listening to? Um, she is a senior director of the Daring Way. She leads the Daring Way Internship Program. That's our program for clinicians and therapists and counselors. She also oversees our internship program with MSW students who get trained in our work and they deliver the work at different therapy groups around Houston. It's incredible. Oh, Barrett's telling Ashley, get close to it. Why don't you pull the microphone towards you? And you have to. Can I just hold it and dance? Yes. Yes. That will good. Dan- Dancing okay. Queen. <laughs> that's, that's my ringer for Ashley when she calls Dancing Queen. Barrett's is brown eyed girl. Just too much information. Shit, man, we're not even through the bios yet. Okay. <laughs> Barrett. In a world where I'm always losing my mind, Barrett Gian is chief of staff for Brene Brown Education Research Group. With her team, Barrett runs a big team. Barrett supports both me and the organization by helping prioritize competing demands, managing relationships, and building connective tissue and strategy across all the business initiatives. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in kinesiology from the University of Houston. Whose house? Coon's house. After more than a decade in education in the Texas Panhandle, Barrett and her family made the move back to Houston. What do we say about that, Ashley? Hell Woo-hoo. yeah. About time. Yeah. Come on back to join our team and help make the world a braver place. You can find her most of the time with her family, us and her immediate family and the big extended family, enjoying her daughter's games. It's not unusual if she texts me on Saturday morning saying, can't talk, have two soccer games, softball game, and something else. I don't know. (laughs) Basketball. Frankie, her husband, makes great burgers, and she likes to float in water, any water. Mostly it's the bathtub. No. (laughs) Do you take a bath? No. Are you a bather? I'm not a bather. Oh, me neither. We were raised like, don't be in that dirty water. Like, we're just, are you? Do you like to take a bath? No, I don't like that. If I do take a bath, I have to take a shower after. (laughs) And she's my pickleball partner. Did I mention that? Okay, let's get started. All right, questions. Number one. Well, so we found these questions from the sister series over the summer and social media, right? Yeah, Jen. Let's jump into this first question that we received from the Summer Sister series <laughs> on social media. On social media. Okay, number one, like you really want our advice <laughs> That's what I'm say right now. Okay, number one, what do you do when you're not a perfectionist, but you're always looking for that something else to be happy? Oh man, I'm so terrible at that. Pass. Not it. 
<laughs> Go, Barrett. <laughs> we're all doing the nose goes. And we're all big card players. So we're looking at each other like, pass. Yep. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're all bad at it. We all do this. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that I don't think you have to struggle with perfectionism to always be looking for that panacea or that thing that's going to make everything better. And so I guess we can like collectively talk about what our therapists have told us <laughs> yeah. and pass that along. I'll give you their names. And you can Venmo them after this is over. <laughs> I know that I'm always looking for that something. I look for that when I don't have the emotional or physical energy to turn toward my life to understand what's not going well. Because normally it's not that my life is not joyful or it's unhappy. It's something's going on that I want to numb or replace. Like I think, oh, if I just redid my office or if I got a new car or if I change my hair or I mean, it's usually because I'm running from something, not towards something. So you can never find the thing that will make you happier because you're not actually running towards something intentional. You're running from something you don't want to dig into. That's my experience. What about y'all? I would totally agree. Usually if I'm finding myself struggling with perfectionism, it's because I need to stop and say what's happening in my life right now that I'm not dealing with and why am I trying to numb it? Yeah. Like what is it that I can't control that's scaring me right now? Yes that I can't make perfect, that I can't get into order, that I can't put in the bento box? What is it that I can't control right now that's driving these behaviors? And sometimes it's not perfectionism. Sometimes it's foreboding joy. I mean, it's all under the armor, but it's like all of those things for me. If I am trying to find something else that make me happy instead of just finding the gratitude in the daily moments or overall, it's because I'm armored up for some reason. Same. Yeah, same. I do the same thing and I can just like be like, Lane, I don't know if y'all do this. So if you don't, just say you do. So I'm not alone in it. (laughs) So you want us to lie? Yeah. (laughs) We got got you. Like, I don't know if y'all do this, but sometimes I'm like making up a workout routine in my head for a bit. Like when I'm laying in bed, I'm like, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start doing it Monday. And then Monday comes and I have like a little cough or something. I'm like, I'm really sick this time. So I have to wait until next Monday. (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about. No. So it's like (laughs) always waiting for that something else. It's like, I don't know what's getting in the way, but it's usually not the little sniffle. (laughs) I do the same thing. I mean, there is nothing better for me, especially when I'm thinking about like healthy eating and not dieting or restrictive, but just healthy eating. There's nothing better for me then the meal that you eat between the commitment to change your eating yes. habits <laughs> and then the start date, yes. like that meal, that chicken fried steak. Best ever. Best mashed potatoes, cream gravy. <laughs> best. Cornbread or roll? <laughs> roll. With that meal, roll. I'm roll too, but butter, right? Yes. Yeah, because you have to have it for the gravy. Yeah, totally. Like butter on the roll, butter on the mashed potatoes. Well, while we're at it, we should just go ahead and plan the next night. To have chili with cornbread since you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think running towards something with intention is sometimes okay, but running away from something and toward whatever will grab you out there to make that thing that you're running from better, that's why I think the emptiness. Yeah. And I think you really touched on something because, like, the emotional bandwidth, sometimes for me, it's about discipline. And I don't know about y'all, but I've just felt so exhausted for like the last six months. And so especially right now, it's like even harder, I think. For me, it's been since COVID. I haven't been like my full. Yeah. I, I don't think people understand the physical toll that emotional labor takes. Jeez. Yeah. And those small moments that fill you back up after you go to hard places, have been non-existent for a lot of people. So for a lot of people, it could be laughing about a TV show at the kitchen bar with all your friends at work. Well, we haven't been in the office since March of 2020. So those little small moments that can fill us back up and bring us joy have kind of been non-existent through COVID and the pandemic. It's been hard. And I think when you're in something really hard, like caregiving for parents, you just keep doing the next right thing. But I think if you pulled out of it and thought, wow, let me observe what's happening. You'd be like, 
oh, I can't believe they're still standing right now. Yeah. You know, and I think you can't, totally. you don't have that luxury when you're in it because you just got to keep, you know. Yeah. It doesn't stop. It doesn't coming stop. At you, it's yeah. unrelenting. Yeah. And it's emotionally painful and physically painful. So I think, yeah, I get running toward, what is it just out of curiosity? What kind of things do y'all run toward? Like, what is this something else that you look for sometimes to make you happy? For me, it's either organizing, (laughs) redecorating, or some type of activity. Like, even if it's like, we're going to have a family walk the dog every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. (laughs) Like, some type of movement. Yeah. I would say it's definitely planning or organizing. Like, I'm going to plan and organize because those are some things that I have control over. Whether or not I follow through, at least putting that down on paper. Like, I have a Trello board for my house and every board, different room. It is, like, organized. You cannot even believe it. Me too. None of them really say complete. (laughs) And it's so hard because, it's like, you have a beautiful Trello board, a beautiful Pinterest board, and a shit ton of things in your shopping cart. (laughs) But that's it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Do y'all know over, like, the last 10 years, I bet I've bought $5,000 worth of scrapbooking materials? (laughs) Yeah, I do because Gabby has those now. (laughs) Great. Then I don't feel bad about it at all. Yep. And one time I was like so sure that I was going to do it. I bought y'all stuff, remember? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we were all going to do it together. We even had our own little mini printers. Yeah. When I say I go in, I go in hard. (laughs) Um, But I've never made a scrapbook. But that's all right. Okay. Those memories are in your head. Yeah. Look how happy Gabby is with all my equipment. (laughs) Totally. Okay, how do you manage upset responses from others after choosing discomfort over resentment? Fuck you. No. <laughs> I was going to say resentment. <laughs> oh, boy, you caught us on a bad raw day. <laughs> um, no, really, how do you? Oh, it is like you muster up the courage to, to like really stand your ground and be in your boundaries, and then they're shitty in response. It's like, no, sir. Not today. Sit down. Sit down. All right. So if we break down this question, how do you manage upset responses from others after choosing discomfort over resentment? So for those of you new to the choose discomfort over resentment, that's kind of our boundary line. So when we have to set a boundary, it's really hard. And a lot of times when we choose not to set a boundary, it's because we're choosing to betray ourselves over being disliked or disappointing someone else. So our motto is just choose discomfort over resentment. So it's a minute or five minutes of discomfort over what ends up, I think, cumulatively being a lifetime of resentment, right? Yeah. And so this question is when you say, you know what, I appreciate you asking, I can't do that. And then they come back with something that's crappy. How do you handle that? And I think for me, it happens to me all the time Mm -hmm. because you see, I mean, Barrett, especially in work, you see me set boundaries all the time and people will come back and be shitty about it. And I'll just say, I understand that you're disappointed or upset. I'm not able to do that. Yeah. Thanks. I'm really pretty good at it. And when you're like trying on boundaries for the first time and people aren't used to you being boundaries, the people around you, it can be really difficult for them to understand where you're coming (laughs) from. So yes. they can be crappy. Yes, because so many of us have set up relationships where we have convinced ourselves that the value that we bring is saying yes to everything. Mm-hmm. And then entire systems, family systems, partner systems, work systems are set up around us being the yes person. And let me tell you something, you don't in a system, throwing it back to systems theory, Ashley, from social work <laughs> school. It. When you are in a system and you change who you are and you start choosing self-respect and self-love over, you know, taking care of other people when you don't want to, the whole system reverberates. You know, that's why in social work, we study systems theory. One move shakes the whole thing. So Barrett, that's a really good point. When you start setting boundaries, a lot of people can be like, wow, who do you think you are? Or, you know, where does that come from? I'll tell you that I can remember the people involved. So Ellen must have been in middle school, maybe. But I was asked to do something for the school. And I was standing with a couple of other parents. I think they were all, these happened to all be moms. And the principal asked me if I would do something. And I said, you know, I really can't take that on right now. My plate's really full, but please ask again. 
And the principal said, you know, she was great. She's like, oh, great. Thanks. I'm glad you said no, because that means I'll ask again if I know that if you can't do it or if it doesn't work, you'll say no, which is just something that people don't think about. Like I'm much more comfortable asking people for things if I know they'll say no, if they can't do it. Yeah. And when I walked away, the two women I was standing with were like, oh my God. Like as if I were in there, they're just talking about me to each other. She just said no. Like she said, no, I'm sorry. I can't do that. And it was like shocking to them. And they were so just, they didn't even, it was like, I made up that they didn't even know that was in the consideration set. It's hard. And let me tell you, in your family too. Talk a little bit about being a boundary bully. Just give us a two minute rundown on the boundary bully. Oh yeah. When I first started trying out on boundaries, I was awful. Like I swung way too far the other way. (laughs) You know, someone would say, oh, this is great. This is a good story. We were pretty strict around violence on television with my kids growing up. Do you, let me just tell you this, this is an aside. Do you know that Ellen, who's now 22 in graduate school, do you know that Ellen tells me that there's a meme, an entire club of people who are identified by not being able to watch SpongeBob growing up? Like, oh, no. no like they, they made, that's like a joke. Like, wow. were you or were you not like dividing into two groups of people yeah. in college? Those who could watch SpongeBob and those who could not. Yeah, and I my did kids, not know that. Yeah, my kids could not watch SpongeBob. Same. Same. Is that because I didn't let mine? I'm the oldest? Probably. Probably. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that. Sorry to my sweet nieces. No, we thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. I just, we we were, so that's that's not, that's not (laughs) violence, but so Charlie and Ellen watched calmer movies till they got older and oh, this was actually, it was Charlie. Charlie ended up going to a friend's house for a play date and he was probably in third grade. And the mom called and said, listen, I just wanted to let you know, oh, I'm conflating two stories. Hold on, let me tell both. First, it's Ellen. She's going to a sleepover. The mom calls and says, hey, we're just gonna do pizza, a movie, and then cotton candy or something. I said, great. And she said, I think we're gonna watch this movie. And I was like, oh, you know what? We're really cautious and thoughtful about what our kids can watch. And we like to use common sense media. And we just really feel like that's super inappropriate. Like I was like shaming her and being judgy McJudge judge, which is like, it, which is a boundary bully. You know, look at me. I'm so thoughtful. And then you see you, you know, like. Blah, blah. In return, that means you are not. <laughs> yeah. In turn, that means yeah. you're not being thoughtful as opposed to saying, you know what? That's probably over Ellen's head. Would you mind doing another film, another yeah. movie? But that's healthy boundaries. But at first you can be a boundary bully. Like, Same, yes. Yes. Yeah. Like hands on your hips, your boundary cape <laughs> flying in the Don't wind. Don't mess with me. I got boundaries galore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the other one was actually a good one. This was another kind of cool lesson. I always think about kids making the transition from compliance to commitment. So when they're little, they have to comply with your rules. And then as they get older, what you're looking for is commitment so that they follow the values of your family, even when there's no one watching. And I remember Charlie going over to a friend's house in third grade and the mom said, you want to come pick him up or I'll send him down the street. And I said, sure. And she said, I just want to let you know that we were watching Jurassic Park. And Charlie said, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to watch that. Can we watch something else? And she said, I just thought that was really great. She said, I was a little concerned because like my three-year-old, my kindergartner were watching it too. <laughs> and then that's when I knew I wasn't. And I was like, you know what? It's probably great for some people, but for us, you know, he hasn't seen anything like that. And so probably better that he watches the first the first time with us. Have y'all been boundary bullies before? hundred uh, percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't think of any specific examples, but... I think I even came to you and I was like, whoa, I am like out of control. And you're like, let me tell you the story about boundary bullies. And I was like, that's where I'm at right now. (laughs) You know, I think it's when boundaries have self-righteousness attached to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to try them on, though. I mean, it's hard because I definitely fall in the camp of finding value and being the take care of everything can say yes to everything. So trying on boundaries is hard. But let's talk about that because I have value in being the yes person and not disappointing anybody either. But then I do disappoint people because I can't deliver or I'm late or I cancel at the last minute. Disappoint yourself. And disappoint yourself (laughs) and have to choose commitments at work that I said yes to over my family. And then there's grief attached to that and Mm -hmm. rage, Yeah, you know? And so I think pretending that we can deliver on things 
that we actually can't deliver on because we're afraid to say, I need help or I can't do this, ends up hurting a lot of people, not just ourselves. It's really hard too, because like the work that I do, there's so many people in the world that might not have places where they can go and ask for help. So when I heard you saying that, I mean, like the first thing that came to my head was, I feel so lucky to be in the opportunity where I can ask for help or I can stop and say, oh my God, Brene, I'm I'm like out of control. And, you know, to be able to talk about it or to call Barrett. And so one of the things that I see is like this real struggle of what do I, like this, even this question, like, what do I do when people are upset or hurt and where can I go? So, so many people don't have that. And I love the idea of talking about how we can cultivate new friendships or relationships around being, I don't know if it's an accountability partner or maybe just someone I can check in with about it. So I was just thinking that when you said that, all of that came into my mind when you said that. Yeah, no, because I'm thinking about, you know, a lot of the clients that you run groups yeah. with that don't have a safe place to try on or say, wow, yeah. that shit didn't work today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and the consequences are huge sometimes yep. if they make the wrong call. Yeah. Yeah. So to be able to practice them even maybe before you put them into place or... A lot of the times when I think about this question, I think about living big and this idea of the grief that can come with it. So we set boundaries, but when we set boundaries, there can be this really hard, sad grief part around the boundaries because sometimes we lose people if that boundary isn't met, you know, in a personal relationship, family, stuff like that. And so just be able to have someone to check in with and... Look about around what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, because there is a reality and we've all lived it where you say, you know what, this behavior is not okay. I'm not going to subject myself to it. And that person says, you know, then see you later. Yeah. And that leaves you in a really painful, can be really painful, especially with people you care about and love. Yeah. And then you have to think, wow, if that's the case, if I'm making a reasonable request about how we show up with each other. And that request is met with, you know, then fuck you, this relationship's over. Then what were the terms and conditions of that relationship to begin with? Yes. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Totally. It's really tough. Boundaries are really hard. Prentice Hempel is a therapist and an embodiment coach and They have the most incredible definition of boundaries that I just keep going to often, often. I actually write about it in Atlas of the Heart that boundaries is the closest distance at which I can love both you and myself. That Mm kind of just felt like a little punch in the gut. Mm -hmm. The closest distance at which I can love both you and myself. Sometimes it's so much harder to love ourselves than it is to love other people. And so to get to a place where you can do that is really cool. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. Ashley mentioned living big. That's from, is that from Rising Strong? Yeah. And it's something that we try to practice what boundaries need to be in place for us to be in our integrity and be generous toward others. I think we'll, let's do a sister series on just living big. Can we list people that we have to do it with? <laughs> <laughs> that math teacher is still in my head. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we cannot list anybody. No, I, don't even, I, don't I even, love that session. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do, we'll do a living big. Yeah. It's one of the toughest things we teach. People get go just get it's pissed. Hard. It's hard. We'll do it. It's we we, we all went Texas. It's hard. <laughs> hard. Weird. Okay. How can you tell the difference between polling and genuinely seeking advice from people who matter? We did this actually on the sister series because I don't know if y'all remember, but we were talking about polling and I said, oh, I was totally polling because I was like, guys, which middle school should Amaya go to? And then we started talking about what the difference was between that that wasn't really polling, that that was actually seeking advice from people that I trusted and meant a lot to me. And so I think that we could give some really good examples around this one. Go for it. (laughs) I'm always like, when I'm polling, I'm like, I'm polling. I know I'm polling. And it really doesn't matter what your opinion is because I already know. I just want to know what everyone else thinks. And I want you to know that I'm struggling. <laughs> and so for me, it's neither of those. It's not that I want you to know I'm struggling and I don't want to know what your opinion is because I really usually don't give a shit. It's just if things go bad, it's your fault too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I need like misery doesn't love company. It demands it. 
Yeah. <laughs> Another great saying brought to you by the 12 step rooms, but it's, <laughs> but it's true. I just want to be like, well, I mean, I talked to, I don't remember her name and I don't know who she is exactly, but I saw her at the bus stop and you know, like, like she said, yeah, I want backup. I want backup in case things go wrong. I want to be able to share the blame. I think for me, it is totally about my own struggle around using my voice when I should be using my voice. And instead I'm like going around and polling and saying, that was hurtful, right? I should be upset about that, right? Like instead of just coming up and staying, that was hurtful and I can't believe it happened. I can start polling and making sure that I am mm. okay in my thoughts about feeling hurt. So self-trust, it's validating. Yeah. Yeah, it's about self-trust for It you. totally can be because one of the things that I work on with my therapist, which I think we talked about last time too, is just using my voice instead of sitting in the resentment. And so I think for me that that's really when I can start polling. That's really insightful. When do you pull? And hurtful to and say out loud, to, to be honest, because I would rather use my voice. Yeah. And if it hurts you and it was hard for you, does it matter if five people say, no, I don't think it was a big deal? No, because then I hate them too. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't know. Let me phrase yeah. it in a different way. Sit down. <laughs> Barrett? When do you pull? I don't know. I think I pull what I want people to know that I have them struggling with a decision, but I'm not really care what you have to say about it. I just want yeah. you to know that it's hard and it's out there. As someone, I seek a lot of advice. I mean, I did it to earlier today. Like I really will call people whose opinions really matter to me and say, can I run something by you? I've got a gut on it, but I want to see if I'm missing any, if I'm not zoomed out enough to see something or if I'm missing any data points or if you've got some questions that I need to be thinking about that I haven't answered yet. So as someone who seeks a lot of advice and mentoring and coaching and therapy, I really respect that. And people, you can see in the comments when I posted something about this that people got it confused yeah. between polling mm -hmm. and asking for advice. But polling is when you're looking for an answer that only you can give yourself. It's really about self-trust. It's really about self-trust. And when I'm asking a coach or a mentor or a colleague for advice, my asking is not a reflection of my absence of self-trust. My asking that specific person is a reflection and a function of my self-trust. Yeah, totally. Does that make sense? Yeah. Totally. So I think maybe the core, and I'm just coming to this as we're talking, is that asking for advice or seeking counsel or mentoring will feel good when it's a function of self-trust. When it's because I don't trust myself, that becomes pulling. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. All right. Last question. How do you be authentic with people who are absolutely not authentic? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, it just disguises itself in so many different ways. The lack of authenticity. I mean, yes. first of all, I don't know that there are authentic people and non-authentic people. So maybe we'll like, reframe the question. Yeah, I can be both. Yeah. Let's reframe the question is, how do you practice authenticity with someone who's not practicing authenticity? And that way, refrain from dividing people into authentic and not, because it's, we know from the data that authenticity is a choice that we make every day, sometimes every hour. And we can all chameleon out very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Raise your yeah. hand if you can. Like that's hands all three up. of us have hands up. So... I have to say that, and y'all check me on it. Like I'm giving y'all permission to like call me out on the live on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm pretty authentic most of the time. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. I like, maybe it's just age. I don't know, but it's. <laughs> I know, I'm so tired. I'm like, this is just what you get. This is what you get. Yeah. So I don't think I, I think I'm pretty authentic all the time. And I have a lot of privilege to be able to do that because I'm successful. And I have influence in some areas. And so I get to be who I want to be. And really, and if you don't like it, tough shit. In 99% of the places I'm in, really tough shit if you don't like it. I will say that I didn't get here by being inauthentic. I think I used to be really inauthentic. I could be pretty much, I mean, just to survive growing up, I think in our family, I could be anything or anyone you needed me to be yeah. on the drop of a dime. And I could read people very quickly and be that. 
um, wild girl, good girl, you know, mm-hmm. beer country drinking, girl. pot smoking, yeah. country girl, whatever it what I needed to be, I could do it. But I think that the ability to do that did not lead to my success. But really, when I look back at the hard work I've had to do and the biggest threats to myself, my marriage, my integrity as a parent, the biggest threats to myself and my success have been being inauthentic. That's really led to almost every failure, major failure I've had. The failure of my first book could go back to, to could go back to two types of armor that I can almost not be around these days, which is hustling and proving. Mm, tough for me too. Tough for you too. Like when people are constantly hustling for their worth and validation of their importance, and they're constantly proving and being knowers instead of learners. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I was actually my armor. My armor was more of the good girl, say what I'm supposed to say to make you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. I was always really curious and a learner, but I was a prover. would take on way more than I could handle. I mean, I've witnessed that probably for a solid at least decade. Barris looking at me like that shit's not over yet. (laughs) I I did not. She kind of (laughs) did. I'm getting better at it. Um, (laughs) There's no eye contact being made right now, (laughs) y'all. Everybody's looking at their mic. (laughs) Yeah, I can slip into it for sure. I don't like to disappoint people. I'm having these thoughts right now about how being authentic relates to trust. Here's my question. Good question. That's a good, that's a good linkage. Yes, because it's like, if I have trust in you, or I think I have trust in you, and I think I see exactly who you are and you're being authentic, but then all of a sudden, you're actually not asking for what you need. And you're not doing what you say you're going to do, then are you really being authentic? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Daring Greatly, where you talk about like if you're not also in the arena getting your ass kicked, then I'm not really interested in your feedback. It reminds me of that a little bit. Like it's not like people just wake up every day and say, oh, it's so easy to be authentic. I mean, people work at it. It's hard. It can be a struggle. And to show up authentically and be around people that aren't reminds me of that. Like, I'm not interested in being around you if you can't also do the work and being authentic. Sometimes we don't have a choice. But when we do, it would be a great idea if we could get to a place where we didn't surround ourselves with people that showed up like that. But when we are like at a work thing or something or have partnered up with somebody through business or whatever, and we have to be around them, then I could see that trust coming in for sure around what you were just saying, Bear. Yeah. I'm really thinking about such an interesting, it's such an interesting connection y'all are making. I think if you think about braving, boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault, integrity, non-judgment, and generosity, I don't think when I'm not authentic, I'm not in my integrity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm also not reliable because you yeah. don't know who you're dealing with. Yeah. You know, let's say it's me and we work together and I'm not being authentic. I'm proving and knowing and, you know, I'm going to handle everything. I'm not being reliable, actually. I think I'm being super uber reliable, but I'm being negative reliable because, you know, those plates are going to fall. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a big ass collision. It's going to be a big ass collision. And so I do think authenticity is a prerequisite for trust. 
What's interesting to me, Ashley, about what you said is not everybody can be. So think about this. You know, we've all worked in a lot of organizations and Barrett, you and I have been into a hundred where they ask for authenticity and they want people to be real. And yet they've built cultures where real is white, male, buttoned up, anything that doesn't look like that is not, oh, Renee's being authentic. This is who she is. And let's celebrate that. It's Brene's bossy. Brene's, you know, mm-hmm. Brene's pushing. Brene's asking too many questions. Brene doesn't know her place. And then all of a sudden, if you expect authenticity, whether you're, you know, leading a company or you're a friend, then I think you better expect discomfort. And if you're not willing to expect discomfort, and you're not willing to look at your part in how you quash authenticity on people's part, you shouldn't ask for it. Very much about the podcast we did about stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like, don't tell me I don't belong here. And then when I'm like, shit, man, I don't think I belong here. Say, like, oh, do you have imposter syndrome? You know, like, you should listen to this podcast on Dare to Lead. It's incredible. I mean, I learned so much about that. It's on Dare to Lead and it's with Rachika Tulshan and Jody Ann Burry. And it's just, they both work in the equity, inclusion, belonging space. And it's just, it's really good. So this is what this reminds me of. Yeah. You know, it really resonated with me, the authenticity, integrity piece for Brave Night. Yeah. I thought that was really, yeah, really helpful. And being in the arena, because it's almost like, let me ask you a question. What's the number one trust in your earning behavior for leaders? Asking for help. I ask for help a lot. I feel like. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> but you know what? I ask for help a lot too. Yeah, Same. I agree. Yeah. But I, I think, think we've all really gotten better about asking for what we need. For to. sure. Yeah. Even with each other and like, like, we'll just come full circle. Like even with, you know, taking care of parents. Yeah. yeah. We have, you, you did it today. <laughs> I sure did. Like we were in the middle of a, a minor crisis. I was like, I'm going to have to ask for what I need here. If you want to do this podcast today, I'm going to have to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, great. <laughs> and then I'll just text. I'll be like, no bandwidth, not me. Tag, you're it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's a, that. I'm really grateful for that. Me too. Okay. I appreciate y'all for that. Yeah. And we have to acknowledge too, there's a lot of people that don't have a tag. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God dang. Tough, tough, really tough. All right. Thank y'all for being on the podcast again. Oh, and we'll be back, back. with we'll living big. Yeah. Oh living yeah. Big. We'll do living big for sure. Y'all will love that. That is such a crispy, crunchy, aggravating topic. <laughs> it's so hard. I always love Brene's accent around it too. Cause she's always like, Hey, I'll know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a bad story. That the whole living big story is based on the icing swiper. More to come. <laughs> Yeah. Icing swiper. Icing swiper, swiper, no swiper. Swiper, no swiping. Swiping. Yeah, come on. They were allowed to watch Dora. Dora. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At Miguel and... Diego. Oops. Jesus, no. Maya and Miguel. Oh, I don't know them. I do love the backyard again. <laughs> oh, wait. Have y'all, Me too. Have y'all seen on TikTok? Like, I don't know, you know... We're newer to TikTok, at least Ashley and I are. Now we're like in this <laughs> rabbit hole of TikTok. But it's like uh, the people get together and they sing the intro to the backyard again. So have y'all seen it? Oh, yes. It's I have so not. Cute. Oh, my God. It's a, it's a total thing going around TikTok about six months ago. <laughs> I'm, done. I'm behind. It's I okay. used the word chuggy in front of Brene and Brene looked out of mine and said, isn't chuggy chuggy? I was like, <laughs> oh, whatever, y'all. <laughs> I don't like chuggy. I think it could be shaming. Well, we could just have a story. We could have a podcast about Chugi. <laughs> yeah, because doesn't mean like that's out of style. Yeah. Think about all the people who said my clogs were Chugi. And what's the key to the clogs? You just don't ever stop wearing them from the 70s. They're back. They never were out. Well, if you ask I mean, my feet. <laughs> yeah, ask my feet. Right now, I just saw this article about the shoes you should get for the fall, and there they were. And who's been wearing them every fall since fourth grade? Renee Brown. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you for joining us on Unlocking Us. There's no information to give you here. Call your local mental health professional if this has been too much for you. <laughs> 
We're here on Spotify and join us in staying awkward, brave, and kind. You can see that's a genetic trait, all three of those. (laughs) We'll be back soon. Thanks. Unlocking Us is a Spotify original from ParCast. It's hosted by me, Brene Brown. It's produced by Max Cutler, Kristen Acevedo, Carly Madden, and Tristan McNeil. And by Weird Lucy Productions. Sound design by Tristan McNeil. And music is by the amazing Carrie Rodriguez and the amazing Gina Chavez. 